last week um i wasn't able to present the um the love uh because actually i didn't read the chapter all through at that point and i had to uh, postpone because i need to go because when i was going through the lab i understand that i need to go back to understand some concepts so and i didn't start it didn't early um but fine today i was able to go through it already um yep so um can you see my yeah. browser classification yes. okay so well um so similar to uh, other chapters classification labs um works through all the um algorithm that's introduced and um picking one of them and trying to do some kind of stuff um with a particular data set um i'm using the islr tidy models lab to work all through so kevin i don't know which one do you because last time for chapati i didn't come so do you follow tidy models or the base solutions yeah you can you can do whatever you like, you'd like i think um so either one is fine yeah okay. we didn't we actually didn't do um this is the first like lab we've done the other ones are mostly kind of plotting and importing data so this one's um we focus on the conceptual questions before so right um, but but yeah up up to the presenter whatever you'd like to do is fine all right so um so um uh, the first thing we prefer is to um, look at the data set that we'll be working on on the problems. Um, so the data set um, is uh, basically uh, uh, found in this library. I will see it um, here. Um, here we load some of the stuff we will use, tidy models. So let's look at the data set. So the data set will be examined is called S market, and um, we'll be able to examine it and see what it is so this is a description of the data set this data set consists of percent oh, yeah yes? we're seeing your pdf of the book oh mm. <laughs> no problem <laughs> uh -huh. what about now yeah Small. yeah this is right ah okay All right so um, this is the data set, uh, stock market data, and um, this data consists of percentage returns for the S&P 500 stock index over these days from the beginning of this year to here. And for each date, we have recorded the percentage return of the five previous trading days, like one through like five. So for each day, they record the previous day, they call it lag one through like five. We also recorded the volume, the number of shares uh, in billion, and today the percentage. So these are some of the um, futures that we will see in the data set. So this is the data set. Um, you can see we have the year, and you can see the lag they talk about um, through five, and also the volume of the uh, trading and the day uh, and direction. So the direction, whether the market was up or down, our goal is to pre, uh, make prediction of the direction. So these are some of the features of the data. And the goal is to predict the direction using other these features that uh, we made mention. Um, so let's briefly look at the data. Um, we can see here, um, because the direction here is basically, um, uh, we want to find whether there is correlation on this data. So we just remove the uh, direction here and uh, we find out that um, this is it so we can see um, basically that um, uh, the variables they are uncorrelated and which is quite good because uh, we when we want to do modeling we want to make sure that uh, this uh, doesn't happen because of the problem of such as multiple linearity and stuff like that um the other pi is volume and it is less a uh, little correlated so you can see here we have volume and the year they are little correlated and I think um, we can also do the heat map here and we can see that um, with the heat map we can see that uh, the volume and the year are correlated but all other uh, stuff are uncorrelated so um, so we can see also that um, 
plot in the year and the volume that we find out that they are somehow a little bit correlated, we can see the pattern here also um, shows that um, they are a little bit uh, correlated. So it turns out that all other things we can see they are uncorrelated is probably this um, stuff that are correlated. So um, that is just the uh, looking at the data set, trying to understand um, uh, does the variable correl um, uh, correlate or whatsoever. Um, now we understand that um, these are the futures and what the, what's the, what the correlation is. So we can go and um, doing, um, taking the algorithms one by one. Yeah, so anyone wants to ask something before we move on? No, I just wanted to say that the visualization here is much, much better than they have in the applied or mm -hmm. the labs because that's only um, looking through correlation matrices or pairs of variables. You know, I, I forget what that's called. It's like a scatter plot, not scatter plot, but um, a plot that shows you all of the pairs. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, pairs. And so this is pairs. Yes, thank you. Um, this is much, much easier. Mm -hmm. So thanks, yeah. Sham. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. So this is the heat map for the that shows um yeah so um what do you think um, as we can see here um the year and the volume they are a bit related um uh, but uh, do you suggest um if you are doing modeling what do you think um do you one way do you drop one or what what do you think before you move on because we can see here the um, volume they are a bit correlated but all other what do you think if uh, you are you, you want to move, do modeling with some features that you find too up uh, a little bit correlated. So if they are a little bit, can you just assume that's fine because they are not that much correlated? What, do, what is your feeling? Yeah, I think uh, I think for the most part, like you can you can try different models, you know, with with both of them, with one of them, and see if see if it really changes uh, mm -hmm. predictions that much. Um, I think that's one way of. of kind okay. of trying to assess that um, mm -hmm. yeah but if it's if it's not like a i mean if it was a 0. 0.5 the correlation mm -hmm. 0. 0.54 yeah um i think it's on the one below it uh the, the that one yeah yeah mm -hmm. 0. 0.54 mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think i think that's i don't know i feel like that's i mean it's a strong like a moderate correlation, but I don't know if mm -hmm. it would cause problems for this model. Yeah, right. I mean, this case is just a growth of the volume of the stock market over time. You're seeing it's not. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And what are you, and you're predicting the volume or? No, um, no. Predict direction. And then do... Oh, direction. Right. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Which is just the sign of today, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to uh, see um, the first um, algorithm um, we did in the chapter is logistic operation. Um, um, so um, we can see here, we're gonna fit um, using lag one through these, the futures and volume. So these are the stuff we're gonna use um, because if you look at this year, we have the year, we have the volume. So I guess like they are dropping the year and use only the volume. So if you look at them here now, let's um, and in tidy models, we need to create uh, use partnership. So here we said, okay, this is a logistic regression. We set the engine. So the engine, what we're gonna use is GLM and now the mode is classification. So this is something that's using them. Um, uh, if you are using um, uh, regression, you put this in regression. Yeah, so this, we said this one. And basically, if we uh, do the specification here, then we can define the uh, fit the model. So something like this, we look up the specification here, which is this, uh, and we fit it. And we said that this is log one through five and the volume, and we provide the data. And what we are predicting is the direction. So you can see here, um, because year and volume, they are correlated, they just drop year, and now just use one. And now we have the fit. So we can see here, this is basically the partnership uh, model. Um, we have the coefficient um, and uh, we have some stuff like, but we can um, take the summary. We can use this. Um, if we look at it, this LR fit that we fit and we can flow uh, fit and now take the summary here. 
and now it can give us um, more comprehensive information about this stuff. So we can see here, this is a, uh, for example, minimum and median and stuff like that. And this is the estimate and this is standard error. This is the P values. And we still can do it using tidy to um, extract uh, the important information here. So we can see when we use tidy this guy and we can have this um, extract this information uh, at the middle. So this is basically um, trying to fit the model. So here we fit the model. But what we want to do is to do the prediction, right? So to do the prediction in tidy model, we use the predict uh, function and now we uh, put our partnership object and now provide the data we want to use. So uh, the data is SM market. Um, so you can see here is still the data that we um, fit the object, meaning this data is still the data we're using for training and prediction. Um, so we predict up, down, up, down, something like this, right? Um, uh, but you can also still get the results in Tibo um, because uh, uh, in, uh, in pro with probability, so we can see here, we can use the same function here. Uh, we fit it, but we put the type we need is probability. And now here we can see the probability uh, probabilities for each prediction for the first one and up to the last object. Um, yeah, so this is how we do the prediction. So um, for model performance, trying to find out um, how the model works, um, uh, meaning to find maybe the, uh, the confusion matrix and stuff like that. So we can use Eggman here, we can fit, uh, fit it for the uh, object here, the data. And now we can call this function confusion matrix. And now we provide the ground truth, which is the direction we have and uh, the extent, which is prediction class. So this allow us to uh, find the confusion matrix and we can see here um, up and down, up and down. And we can see here 14757. Seven. Well, this is not really doing a great job because we know that a good model will have something really um, uh, uh, in this direction, but something here at zero, but we can see it's not good. Yeah, so here a good performing model will ideally have high numbers along the diagonal, um, up, left, down, right, with small number on the diagonal. So we need to have small numbers here, but um, the numbers here should be high. So we can see this model is not good enough because um, it does not actually um, does a great job. So. Um, yeah, so we can also use the confusion matrix here. Um, sometimes we use the graphical representation to show how confusion matrix work using autoplot here. So we can just add uh, autoplot heat map uh, on top of this guy. Um, so here we have, we can see the prediction uh, using the heat map. Um, we can also calculate various performance uh, metrics such as accuracy. Um, so, so here where we see, um, that's why, um, I like the tidy models um, is really consistent in some way, as we can see here, uh, what we did for here, we can just repeat the same approach in the uh, subsequent algorithm. So here you can see, uh, we can use this something and now we can call this function accuracy instead of for us here that we call confusion matrix. So it, this gives us the accuracy. So we can see that uh, the accuracy is not um, great as we already saw from the uh, confusion matrix, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but the question um, I have here is that, uh, do we always, um, uh, why do we need to show confusion matrix if we have the accuracy? So is it for us to end, even understand the explanation where the model mix all this stuff? That's why we need confusion matrix, right? I think they give given a good example where I forget which one it was, but one of the cases it was, hey, if you if you only use the results when the predicts up, you get a better accuracy than if you just use it for both cases. So for example, you say, oh, I will ignore the model unless it predicts up. And then when it predicts up, I will trust it more for its prediction, mm -hmm. if it, right? So then you only care about like the second row of your confusion matrix, right? That's why, I think that's where the confusion matrix is useful. It helps you diagnose a little bit what's going yeah, on exactly. too. Like, exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, I was going to say, and also, uh, when you have a very imbalanced uh, outcome, like classes, the mm -hmm. accuracy can be kind of misleading. Because, like, it's if it's yeah. if it's ninety percent one class, and you have a model that predicts that class every time, it'll mm -hmm. be 
it'll be 90% accurate, but the, um, the, on the, but the, I guess the, what is it? The false, uh, false negative or, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or false, uh, sorry, false negative rate will be really high. Right. right that'll right. stare you, you uh, in the face Yeah, when in the confusion matrix. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, so um, this brings us something that um, Kevin was saying, like um, if we have um, imbalanced data, um, I, I think the ideal ones to use uh, for classification, um, one may use for weighted F1 score, uh, which basically um, deal with all those situations. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, in a nutshell, accuracy is not the best, um, um, uh, best thing to work in classification, um, especially if you have uh, unbalanced data. Okay, so we can see here um, the model. Chef, uh, one one question. So how what's accuracy? How is that computed? Is it um, like uh, test okay. error or yeah? Okay, so accuracy is calculated based on um, total pre true prediction. So I, is true prediction all true prediction all over the total? I cannot know the formula. So let me show you um, accuracy. Okay. Uh, Confusion from confusion matrix. Let's see confusion matrix. Um, so, so um, yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So, if you look at this, this is accuracy. Oh, so okay, okay. Accuracy is the sum of um. So here we have true positive, uh -huh. false positive, false negative, true negative. Yeah. So accuracy is the sum of all true positive and true negative. This this one here, this is um, divided by the sum of everything here. Oh, this oh okay. Accuracy. So accuracy is telling us how true your, the percentage of true uh, your model is. Okay. Um, yeah, so but um, uh, in, in in cases where we have um, um, data set that is unbalanced, this is not actually going to be work. So for example, we use um, F1. Um, so F1 is somewhere here, I think. Um, so uh, I can see specific sensitivity. Uh, yeah. mm. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, F1 is equals to, is it one divided by, is somewhere here? Um, um, okay, um, I, I, I cannot remember precisely, but uh, there is F1 that is, um, calc yeah, so this is F score. So F score, is, you can see, is equal to, so here you can see we have this table, we have precision, which is true positive, all over true positive by false positive. Recall is equals true positive by this. So, um, F score is equal to this guy's time this all over this time. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, maybe oh, I think it's okay. chapter. Yeah, I'm not sure if the chapter discussed about the F score. Um, I'm not sure. I don't recall in this chapter. Yeah. Me maybe either. later. Yeah. Um, later chapters. Yeah. Oh, okay. But um, for class. Okay. Right. Okay. So this awesome. Is, Thanks, Jim. Okay. So this is accuracy and. Um, yeah, so we can see that we use the same data set. Um, so let's use evaluate on on same data and see whether the model will work um, uh, much better. So um, the thing is, let's um, split the data into some pieces. So here we split the original data into uh, train and test because from the original data we just split it. And I think there is some better way to use um, entirety models um, to do uh, train test split, but this is yeah, just using um, some uh, traditional way to do the splitting. So now let's fit the model, the same stuff. Um, so this is the predict what we want and the bottom. Um, this is the data, the trend data. And now we fit the data, the same thing. And you, we can see this is what's happening. And uh, so we can see the accuracy is 0 0.48. So we see that this model is not more uh, likely to predict down rather than up. So yeah, um, also, so how the model perform was on the last model. This is effect since we are evaluating on any data. Yeah. So you can see here because we are evaluating the same data, we have this performance. But now here we are evaluating on the text data, and it shows the uh, 
uh, performance to generalize, which basically doesn't score works well. Um, so, uh, um, yeah. So, so, um, okay. So here the ones who um, uh, use two um, values, lag one and lag two, to see um, where the models would work. Um, so you can see here the same thing, trend data. And now here you can see we fit on test data, fit um, and confusion matrix. And now we calculate the, I guess, the, and we can see an increase. Of, the model is still not perfect. It's starting to perform better. So, but uh, we can see when we fit with few variables, so it was um, better. Um, so this means that um, sometimes um, the more variable you have, um, is it cost of dimensionality reduction or was what? What can we say? Because we can see here the same data, but we use few variables. It gave us um, a better performance. Um, what can um, uh, what can we say about this? Um, comparing with the previous one, with uh, five um, uh, this variable, but with fewer variable, it makes uh, better performance. So, what phenomena can we say here? All right. So I mean, one thing, one thing is it, it's not that much better. I mean, yeah. point, point five, <laughs> six, point five, six versus what? Point yeah, five, four, three. Four, but if you go to the first one, go up more. Uh -huh. There's there's one that's better. Or, or is that, this is on the, the test set. So it's this is on test. Yeah, yeah, so it's different. Um, well, in the I mean, it's really not that much better. Yeah. In the text, they say simply that it's because of, um, the additional variables are just adding noise, is mm -hmm. what they said. I'm not okay. quite sure I understood that, but that's what they said. Mm -hmm. So it's right. just, yeah. OK, cool. So um, let's go to, so that's um, the performance of uh, logistic regulation. Let's see um, LDA. Um, so the same data set um, uh, we're going to use. Um, but here, because it's so that uh, maybe the two predictors uh, maybe they make more sense for easy comparison, so they will continue with using two predictors here. So we set our engine um, classification, and we're going to use mass um, we, to set the engine for the uh, discriminant linear analysis. So we use this thing. And now we fit the data. This is it. The same thing with the previous one, and we fit it. And these are the some stuff. And now we can fit with the test data and make prediction. So here we can see this is uh, what we <clears throat> show previously. Um, <clears throat> we can also show the prediction using the probability as before. And we can take a look at the performance using confusion matrix um, and also even the accuracy. Um, we can see we have um, 0 0.560. Um, no mark difference between the analysis of prediction. So, um, so we can see that um, the um, LDA and logistic regression, they have um, quite near performance. Um, then let's move to the another one, uh, quadratic discriminant analysis, um, and see how, whether it can beat um, the previous ones. Okay, so still so the same thing, we're gonna use this discriminant quadrat um, function uh, to uh, set this um, uh, specification. And now this is it. And now we so the classification and the engine is mass. And here we have this, we can fit it. So with two data set and um, we fit it again. And now we put the confusion matrix and now the accuracy. So we can see here we have 0 0.599. And uh, it turns out that I think this is uh, 560. Uh, this works um, a little bit better than the um, uh, um, yeah, so close to 60%. And we are seeing another increase. However, this model still really predict down. So let's look at it. So you can see the model really um, predict downs. Um, so we can see um, it predicting down to be up. So it's not doing well. Um, it's struggling to predict. Um, uh, down, but it's doing well in predicting up, but it's not doing well in predicting down, as you can see here. Uh, these are the rubbish, uh, the mistakes the model does, um, as you can see. So 
um, this make it appear that the quadratic form assumed by really captures the relationship more clearly. Um, okay, um, so anyone wants to ask something before we continue to the next one, neighbors? All right, okay, so let's move on to neighbors. So we now see um, three methods. We, can, we saw logistic regression and we saw uh, LDA and now we recently see QDA quadratic discriminant analysis. Um, so let's look at the next one, which is naive bias and see how it works on the same data set. Remember, we are using the same data set uh, uh, as market data. So um, the same stuff we use for um, uh, previous ones. Um, here, uh, we're gonna, um, um, we're gonna use um, because the engine here, uh, you, it has some kind of um, what do you call it parameters or um, yeah parameters, no, no. yeah. So here we said this. What do you call is it in machine learning? Not parameters, uh, hyperparameters. So here we said this. Don't use the kernel. Um, now we just specify this uh, in NERVIS, we use classification and use this to set engine here. that support NERVIS and now we fit it with the same data. And now we use confusion metrics and we can see how it works. And now the same thing we call the accuracy and we see has this performance 0 0.591. So we can see here 0 0.591 is still similar, looks similar to this 0 0.599. Um, so the accuracy owner is very similar to Kitty. You know, this seems reasonable since the below scatter approach that there is no accurate relationship between lag one and lag two. Then have by the assumption of independently distributed but is not all reasonable. So we can see that um, one of the assumptions that naive bias does is um, uh, the futures, I think, uh, independently distributed predicts uh, it needs. So we can see here the lag one and lag two, they are independently uh, predictors. Um, yeah, so uh, no apparent, uh, we can see correlation between the two. So that's uh, the performance of um, uh, naive base. Um, in, in essence, we can see that the naive base uh, works uh, uh, similar to this, but they beat all the previous one, right? They beat um, uh, LDA and the QDA. Uh, so in in essence, we can see that uh, naive base um, works, uh, and the previous one they work uh, somehow a little data, but not that good. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, anyone wants to add something? Is this monthly data? What's the what's the Sorry? granularity? Sorry? Is it daily data? Is a day each each observation is a day? Or? Um, yeah. Let's go back and see. It stays. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, one hundred and this days, previous days, five previous. Yeah, it's. I think it's consecutive days. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next one is um, nearest neighbor. So um, uh, the k nearest neighbor uh, makes some assumptions. Um, we know um, for us to use k nearest neighbor, we need to specify how many neighbors we're gonna consider to uh, do predictions. So here is, we need to specify uh, the neighbors we're gonna use um, three. Uh, so that is one of the, Particular for Kinearis neighbor model. Um, this is still did something with um in this one, um, fit the model and uh, produce the data, and we can see some of the uh, the k, the value of k is three, and the kernel we're gonna use is optimal, um minimal misclassification, nominal. Um, yeah, so and we do the evaluation here and um we calculate the accuracy. And we can see we have zero five ish. Um, so we can see um, Kanan does not perform well on this data set um, because the previous one, as we can see, um, does have some kind of performance zero point five nine. Um, but 
um, uh, Canaan pretty well um, in some data set. This means that um, uh, no free um, uh, an algorithm may not work in all data sets. So when you are trying to do machine learning, as they say, like trying to um, use multiple algorithms and see uh, which one works on your data. So maybe KNN does not work well on this data, but what they said is um, let's try different data set and see where KNN can do uh, a good job. So um, we'll try using KNN as a model and application to carbon insurance data. So gonna use another data set different from the data set we have been seeing called caravan insurance data. This data set include 85 predictors that measure demographic characters of this individual. So it has these three. And the rest from variable is part, which indicate whether or not a given individual purchase is caravan insurance policy. So in these predictors, um, we wanna find out whether the person purchased this insurance policy or not. And this is I said only six percent of people purchase. So the data said we have even the percentage of people that buy the insurance, which is six percent. So let's look at how that works. So let's split data. So here is splitting the data. Um, uh, we can see here. Uh, we said I think uh, um, here the um, uh, the take the test set to be one thousand and that wants to be the. Uh, training set. So here you can see with the bad, but um, uh, the best way to use trend te uh, split test from uh, tidy model, but here just using the uh, classical way of dividing the uh, stuff. Um, right. So um, one thing we should also look here is that um, KNN, um, because it talks about uh, uh, distance major, right? So because KNN it use Keras Neva and use some distance to uh, some distance to is distance based um, machine learning algorithm, right? So um, we need to make sure that um, all features are normal in uh, that have um, uh, the same uh, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, this uh, normalization. Um, I I don't know what. It does uh, stop normalize. So when we normalize, we want to put it. Is it the same? Um, the same scale. The same. Yeah, the same. The scale. same. The same units, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um. But what I'm trying to remember is um when you are um normalize up um what do we use? Which algorithm? Which method do we use to normalize? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what that one's doing, but it's probably something like centering and scaling, like, like, yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. Subtracting, yes, yeah. subtracting yes, yeah. every observation by the mean, yes. the mean, yes. and then uh, dividing mm -hmm. by the standard deviation or something. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. like Z scoring? Yeah, Thanks, that's what Bob. they did in the book, yeah. Z scoring. Okay. Just so the distances are the same. I guess, in normal, I guess subtracting the mean doesn't matter in that case, but certainly the. Scaling yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, something like this um, normalization yeah. formula. So, we, yeah, we have different kind of um, uh, normalization stuff. So, yeah, so here they just normalize the predictors to make sure they are in the same scale. So, yeah, this is our recipe. And um, we're going to create a workflow. Here. So, this is something that we haven't done. Um, uh, so, in in a tidy model, you can actually create what is called workflow. And uh, in workflow, you add your recipe here. We uh, add our recipe here. So here we have a workflow recipe. And now we can create um, KNN model specification now, as we did before. So here you can see first what we did. We already know if you want to do machine learning, the first thing you need to do is to just make sure that your all our data is uh, um, we do some kind of pre-processing. That is what we do first here. That is to normalize the futures in the sense scale. So this is what we do here. And the next one here is just to create some kind of workflow that we're gonna use, but um, creating the specification start from here. So we said KNN, nearest neighbor classification, and the engine is KNN. And now we can use, because basically we're gonna have, um, we want to use um, a different uh, K neighbors. So that's why we wanna use the workflow. So here we, um, KNN1, um, we provide the uh, neighbors. Uh, here is one, and here the neighbors is three, and here the neighbors is five. So 
that we can run this stuff all with different kind of um, uh, kit. So we can see here, we fit it um, when we create the workflow and now we fit the model here with the data and with the workflow here, we can see that. And this is the trend data, we fit it here. And now we can create the confusion matrix as usual. And this is, the, this is it, mm, right? Um, we can see here that um, um, for the first one, for the second one, and for the third one, we can see that. Um, yeah, so and it said that the model performance doesn't change much when changing from one to nine. So because you can see here, um, it's nine, nine, nine. So you can see even if we change the K to one up to five here, the model performance doesn't change, um, right? Um, it's still the same thing here. We can see, uh, yeah. But, uh, so let's look at the accuracy. So uh, fitting the model with the our new data. So here we're gonna use the test data. So here we can see the model accuracy is 0 0.83. And so we can see the NN works well on this data set, but it doesn't work well on the previous data set. So <clears throat> um, um, not sure why it doesn't work here, but um, uh, maybe in the book they said it, but I forgot. Um, so um, anyone wants to chip in why um, KNN does not work well on the previous data? Um, okay, right. So um, the last one here we have is poison regression. Um, um, we're gonna use also um, different data sets, um, bike share um, to do prediction. So we'll use a new data set, bike share, and look at the number of bikes rental per hour in Washington, DC. So this is the bike share data. Um, we have season, month, whatsoever. Um, but the variable that interests the number of bike rentals per hour can take on a negative integers value. This makes for example, um, suitable candidate for model selection. So um, so let's start fitting the model. So um, the we can see here, we're gonna use uh, poison regulation for model specification. And we specify this is zero. And we're gonna set the engine GLM. So this is what we're gonna use. And now how will be predicting by predicted? So these are the predicted that we um, <clears throat> by the um, month, um, which is this. Um, the hour, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ah, okay. we can hear you. I can see the Zoom is telling me that my internet is unstable. So that's why I assume that you don't hear me. Okay. No, so, you're still good. Um, we have, okay. So we can see we have hour, um, we have work day, um, but you can see the months of the year coded as factor. So the month is January here. You can see the hour. Um, Coded as factor from zero to twenty-three. Um, this is the hour, the working day. Um, we have that also uh, coded as dummy variables. Uh, zero is one. Um, if it is what the temperature, so what? Are, so as we can see, apart from temp, um, which is this normalized cells, which is this, uh, this is it. Apart from that, um, all other predators are categorical in nature because here they are all factors are uh, the other one thus we will first create a recipe to convert this into dummy variables and then bundle them into a model specification so we know if we have um categorical variables we create the dummy um, stuff to change them to um what we uh, our model can be able to understand right so, so here we have this uh what we want to uh, produce is the biker so these are the man our working day these guys and this is the data. And now we create this top dummy. So this is um, the step uh, uh, stuff that uh, create this um, category. Uh, they, they will change this to um, dummy variables. Much the same we did here um, where we did the step here to you know, our data. So this is somehow kind of a data uh, preparation. We use the step, you can see where we create this. So, here um, you can see um, what we are doing is not uh, normalizing because there the data is basically, um, uh, 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 um, what do you call this? Not, um, uh, it's continuous data. So that's why we use um, normalize. 
But here in category kind data, we create dummy variables. So here we create that. And now we create the um, workflow here. I can see here um, the workflow we provide our recipe here and here. And um, we have the model, um, which is uh, poise spec, um, which is this, uh, the model that we created. So this is it. So with the workflow, we flow the same pattern to fit the model. So we can fit the model here and fit, give the data. And now we can plot the something uh, using this one here. So here um, we can see here, this is the prediction here. You can see so, but here um, this uh, uh, fit data, um, we use this, um, put it here and now use the ggplot and now uh, plot the performance, the prediction. Uh, so here is basically the uh, predicted and here is the actual. So we can also look at the model coefficient to get the feel of the working of the model. So uh, let's here is the um, model coefficient. Um, um, trying to look at the uh, model coefficient with the month. So we have from months to this, we can look at the coefficient also for the hours that uh, we can see here uh, when the model basically um, it in summer, we can see that uh, the rent um, is actually going up uh, because yeah, of course people use bike during the summer and you can see here it coming down December. Uh, we can also see uh, similar, you can look at the coefficient coming to the hour variable. Um, uh, so here the hour is from 8 a.m. to this during the normal office hour, we can see what's happening is that um, uh, from normal working hour, uh, the range, um, the, this uh, increases, right? Um, yeah, up to five, I think. Yeah, you can see from up to five, um, but it start decreasing um, people are not renting. So that's um, how uh, these models um, works. Uh, and this is where the books um, stop. Uh, from poison uh, uh, regression. Uh, but the, the uh, ISLR tidy models lab um, give something <laughs> they call extra, which basically shows us how we can use this uh, for, for these top models in Wangu, um, which is basically the practical way if you want, we want to do um, test a machine learning at one go to see which models work best for us. So let's walk through it a bit and see how it does. So, um, so here what they said, um, uh, let's create a list with the models we want to use. So here we can see here we have gonna use logistic regression, which is it, we're gonna use LDA, um, LDA feed, we call it, and um, we have, we're gonna be we say QDA feed, we can can. So here we use a list to specify the models we are going to use so that we can have a single result rather than, for example, this where we are learning, we go through one by one, predict them using the same data set. We can see here, we use the same data set, right? To put, um, to fit and predict using LDA, we use the same data set to predict using the um, logistic regression, but um, this isn't, doesn't sound practical if you want to uh, do some kind of uh, uh, performance uh, uh, training. So um, this is what is trying to tell us that the best way is to just put all the models in one go and try to fit them in the same data set. So here um, we create the models in a list and now we're gonna use a power package to actually define everything. So here you can see here we have uh, the preds. Uh, here we have IMAP, DF, F, this, this, uh, the tidy, tidy stuff. And now here we put the models, um, here the argument uh, and the new data, um, the data set and the uh, ID model. So we can see here in our previous work, our previous stuff, this is how we do that. So here we, um, let me go back a bit. So here we can see, we create this, name, we specify the model, we set the engine and we provide this, all this goes through this step. But here we wanna try to put them, uh, yeah. So here, this is the model, the argument, this is the data we wanna use. Um, 
this is the um, this is the model. So here also um, we want to select the uh, stuff we want to use: uh, models, direction, pred class, pred down, and pred up. So this is when we're gonna have, and we can also use make today uh, provide we want to use make accuracy we want to use sensitivity we want to use specificity so um these are some of the stuff uh discussed in the book now uh we can pre-group the models uh preds here we have um now we can group the models and use multimetric provide the, the direction the true ground truth and the estimate here so we can see here we have this stuff knn lda and this is the accuracy they going to use the metric they're going to use and the estimator is binary and the, this is the estimate we have so this um, the same token can be used also for rock cap uh, to plot that so this is something that um, um but uh, this shows that if someone wants to put all these giant steps just um in one go to show that right so i think this is what i have um finally um anyone wants to have something yeah um actually this is great sham this especially this last part because I, di I didn't know how to do this um just doing mm -hmm. all of them all at once i have a question so can you scroll up a little bit or scroll down yeah other other direction sorry keep going keep going up or down uh keep going in the same direction that you're going yeah keep going so right there the table that says 12 by four, what is estimator? What does binary estimator mean? Estimator, ah, okay, this one. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so I think um, uh, in understanding is um, the, the classification um, is binary. I don't know if I'm right. The estimator we're gonna use is binary classification. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, because um, what we uh, predict, if you look at the um, data set, uh, uh, smart. Oh, got uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Up and down. So mm -hmm. the kind of um, estimator we are going to use is binary estimator. So yeah, I think that's uh, yeah. Okay, that's because your response variable is binary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It it just the the term estimator was just like throwing me off. Okay. Gotcha. I guess okay. I have a, another general question. So how do you know how much of the data to put in the training set versus the testing set? Mm -hmm. yeah, They're like right. a good rule of thumb. Like, is it like I've heard, you know, 2080, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then um, in some of the applied exercises, it was half that went into each. So how do you decide that? Mm. So, um, I just look at the labs. Um, I haven't even looked at the exercises, but um, what I know is um, mm -hmm. mostly um, uh, rule of thumb, as you said, is like 2080 um, or 2575. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, I'm not quite sure if there's any other thing. I, I don't know if the, the whole next, the beginning of the next chapter is all about this cross-validation thing. So maybe it'll give us some- Ah, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Good, good. Okay. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, Sandra, you're going to cover it. So you're going to tell us. <laughs> okay. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I was just wondering because oftentimes they will mention, you know, why they decide to do certain things. But here mm -hmm. it was like, oh, we'll just go divide like this. So I was like, okay, maybe it's coming later. Okay. I, I should have known. It's probably like uh, anything else. You just have to try different, you know, you may have to try different things. I mean, you use too probably. much. If you don't have enough training, if, training data, you won't get very good fit. If you have done very much test data, you won't be able to know how well your fit is that well. So I guess it's going to be a trade off somehow, like everything else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I guess um, in the labs, they're using a lot of this accuracy, right? So, uh, but of course, there's other metrics that you can use also. So either the accuracy or the test error rate, which is looks to be one minus the accuracy, mm -hmm. um, just as an output to to mm -hmm. look at some number, right? Okay. Probably it'll get into more of this later. Um, I think at the bottom of this, uh, Sam, could you scroll all the way to the bottom of this page? I think you actually, there was a section at the end that showed uh, the like, area under the curve. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, 
Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. So if you graph, you can also look at sensitivity and specificity and then um, uh, calculate the area under the curve for each of these approaches to get yeah, a what they, performance for it. Yeah. What do they call that? They, I remember them doing that. What do they call the Rock. area? Of the uh, oh, the receiver operating something. Uh, uh, well, it's called a receiver. rock curve, but the area under the curve, does that have a name? Like performance power or something like that? I don't know. Was there something uh, I forget? Uh, I think just the, I've, I don't know. I just hear people call it the, the AUC. The area AUC? Under the curve. Yeah, area under the curve, like okay. AUC. Oh, but, AUC. Uh, okay. it, yeah, I'm not sure if there's another name people use. but This was um, curious. Yeah, rock curve, right? A receiver operating characteristic curve. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I actually remember the rock curve because I worked a lot in sensors in my other life. <laughs> mm. I, what did I you, what did you in the real And I never had to, never thought about competing in the area. That's kind of weird, but it seems so obvious now. Yeah. <laughs> what, did, what did you call it? A different name or? No, we just that we just compared the curves directly on graphs. So I don't know. I never thought about that. Okay. Yeah. That's what they call here AUC. I just found it. In there. Question. Sorry, guys. Um, the PDF. Does anyone have the PDF or can I share screen? I didn't share. Sham, are you done? I don't Am want I... to interrupt you. Am I sharing? Yes, you are. Okay, where, where do you want to go? Okay, you can share. I just had a question on that. Uh, okay, okay, let me see. Might be kind of... Oh, did I lose everybody? Uh... I don't know, it says you've started sharing. It says double click to enter full screen mode. Sandra, are you there? Uh, can't hear you if you're talking. Yeah, we seem to, I seem to have lost her somehow. Oh, oh yeah, she somehow. dropped. Oh, she's probably going to reconnect. She probably did something. Maybe wait, wait yeah. 30 seconds to see if she's. Here she comes. Uh, she's back. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, why is my Wi Fi like this? Um, okay, can I do a. Your screen? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All righty. Okay. So, uh, equation 415, Bayes' theorem, right? So, yeah. um, essentially, it's this posterior probability, right? Which is based on the prior, this pi k, right? Which is just like the proportion of whatever observations are in a specific class, right? Times this density function for the class, right? And then you're dividing by the sum of the same, so prior times density function for all of the classes. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think I was just or, getting confused by that. So it's like, thing. The, yeah, like the density of, of, of X given each of the classes. Density of X given each of the classes. Okay. Okay. Like the distribution of, of X. <clears throat> given the classes there it's just okay. it's it's just a normalization right just sum up yeah this. yeah that's what it seems like right so yeah okay cool yeah i still i still i'm still very confused about their approach like of not really introducing Bayes theorem before they're right. like like substituting stuff in i'm like mm. i don't know uh, I think it yeah. would have been. I agree with Kevin. It seems like they skipped a step there. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. We're coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, thanks, Sham. Thanks so much uh, for your presentation. Um, uh, yeah. I think, appreciate it. I, 
I appreciated it too because I actually don't know very much about tiny models, so it's good to see how see them in action a little bit, gives you some inspiration maybe to start learning the thing. Ah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, um, I thought we all know tidy model. That's why I even move fast um, without explaining <laughs> all. <of it>. Yeah. <laughs> no, but no, it's no okay. Worries. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, because I know Kevin, we were in the same club, right, for the tidy model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, uh, yeah, it's totally fine if you're presenting, even if some people don't know, I think. Either if it's like base or tiny models, you know, everyone's going to learn something. So exactly. Um, like I, I don't, I, I would have trouble doing a lot of that in base R. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. It's it is really nice to see, you know, with tidy models how you can just, you know, yeah. Like the difference between those a few of those exercises is literally just changing the, the, uh, the mm -hmm. first argument in yeah. the engine. You know, yeah or the first the first kind of model function and then the engine and it's cool I mean, that you can just do that so easily yeah yeah i mean i really like the way they do this stuff like it's something reusable you just need to take just like um you know mm -hmm. what i was missing in python community where you have a line that you do the same thing they have the same pipeline so this ID model actually comes with um the same stuff um and it's really great yeah yeah, totally. Um, okay. Um, Ron pointed out that uh, the dates were shifted on the signup sheet because of the the week that we uh, skipped last week. So I actually just updated it. It should be should be good now. Um, yeah, I just shifted the dates uh, by week. Um, but yeah, so Sandra, you're still good to present resampling yeah, next week. Yeah, should be. Yeah, it's a awesome. short chapter. You can you can give us the answer to uh, the the optimal splitting. splitting That's right. Uh, I I have seen people talk about that yeah. in a few forums, and no one seems to have like a. It's it's a lot of it, it's like a just kind of a heuristic people use. I don't know. It's, yeah, that's what it seemed if, like. Uh, that's what I that twenty eighty I saw in a class, and so I was like, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. it seems like a rule of thumb. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it does seem like something like intuitively, it feels like something mm -hmm. that should be informed by statistics somehow. Like, yeah. like if you, right. like if you, if you have like, it should be a function to me at least of like sample mm -hmm. size and very vari variability, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it feels like there should be a, um, almost like a, a power analysis or something like that to, I don't know. It just seems it seems that's like it sh shouldn't be a rule of thumb, but uh, that's what I was uh, thinking too. It seems like it should be like, oh, how accurate do I want to estimate my accuracy? Right? What kind of error bar can I tolerate on the accuracy mm -hmm. estimate? That will mm -hmm. dictate how big my test set has to be. Right. 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 And then everything right. left over, I guess, is the training set. But if that turns out really small, then we get to revisit how accurate you can. You see what I'm saying? It's like it seems like a lot of that kind of thinking has to go into it. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. But it but it seems right. like you could formalize all that. Somehow. Yeah. Um, it seems like twenty eighty can't be the answer, right? Like for everything. <laughs> it seems too. It just seems way too clean. Yeah. 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 Um, right. It really turns out to be fifteen uh, eighty five. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, we expect that answer cool. next week, Sandra. I see. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, okay. yeah, yeah, publish a paper or something about it. And we'll, we'll I'll see what I it. can do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, Thanks appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Have a good one. Bye.